Hello and welcome to this lecture on genetic hearing loss. Hopefully learning the function of some of these genes involved will help you remember the phenotypes that they cause. There's two types of genetic hearing loss, non-syndromic and syndromic. So we'll start with the non-syndromic hearing loss. The first gene we'll discuss encodes connexin. Uh, so we'll just draw little green connexin channels all over the stria vascularis and the supporting cells in the organ of cordy. Connexin 26 and 30 are encoded by the genes GJB2 and GJB6, respectively. So you may have heard of those before. Um, they're on the DFNB1 locus. They're really just gap junctions that connect pretty much every cell in the area, except hair cells and neurons, which of course need to have their own um, depolarization, repolarization mechanism. The point of these is that they help maintain the endolymph with a high potassium concentration by recycling the potassium ions from the inner hair cells. The next non-syndromic hearing loss gene is stereocilin. So for that, we'll draw a little magnified view of the stereocilia on the hair cells. And stereocilin is encoded by the STRC gene on the DFNB16 locus. Its function is to connect the kinocilium to the tectorial membrane, and then it connects the stereocilia to one another. Um, interestingly, it's also associated with infertility in males because this STRC gene is linked to CATSPUR2, which is a calcium channel necessary in sperm, and they're always linked together. So in males, you'll see hearing, lo hearing loss with infertility. Next is the TECTA gene. That encodes alpha tectorin. It's on the DFNA8 and 12 locus and DFNB21. It's essential for cross-linking the proteins of the tectorial membrane, so of course is necessary for hearing function. Myosin 15 is located at the tips of the stereocilia, attached to the actin filaments along the length of the stereocilia, and it's responsible for stereocilia growth. The last of the non-syndromic genetic causes of hearing loss is a mitochondrial gene, mtRNR1, uh, codes for the protein MOTS-C, and the mitochondria are organized in the inner hair cells and are super important there. So any mit mitochondrial genes that are essential for mitochondrial function can really impact the hair cells. Hair cells are extra sensitive because they're very metabolically active, constantly repolarizing their membrane potential between firing. Um, MOTC mutations also importantly make mitochondrial protein synthesis extra sensitive to inhibition by aminoglycosides. So people with this mutation also are more prone to ototoxicity from aminoglycosides. Moving on to syndromic hearing loss, we'll start with mutations in type 4 collagen or the COL4A genes. Type 4 collagen is a structural protein in several reg regions throughout the organ of cordy, the retina, and the glomeruli. So people with type 4 collagen mutations can get hearing loss plus hematuria plus retinopathy. And so you may recognize this syndrome as being Alport syndrome. It's X-linked but can be dominant or recessive depending on the mutation. There's a potassium channel called the KCN channel located in the marginal cells of the stria. It's super important in maintaining potassium concentrations in the endolymph. And it's also present in the heart. So the syndrome of these patients is that they have hearing loss and long QT. It's Jervell lang nielsen syndrome. This is a can't-miss diagnosis in kids born with hearing loss because they can develop syncope or sudden death from the cardiac effects. There's another important ion channel in the spindle cells just south of the stria vascularis called pendrin. This is from the gene SLC26A4, which you may have heard of. It's an anion exchanger. It exchanges chloride for bicarb. It also maintains the endolymph, but it's present in the stria and the endolymphatic sac. So dysfunction of this channel can lead to hearing loss, enlarged vestibular aqueduct, and Mondini incomplete partition deformity, which you can think of as if the flow of the endolymph is abnormal, then during development, the cochlear turns are not all going to develop normally. It exchanges another important anion, iodine, in the thyroid, and so dysfunction of this channel also leads to a euthyroid goiter. So this is Pendred syndrome. It's autosomal recessive, but it is the most common cause of syndromic hearing loss. This next syndrome is associated with the pigmented cells of the body. So in the cochlea, these would be the pigmented intermediate cells of the stria vascularis. So the genes involved here are PAX3, which stimulates MITF, 
and that's also stimulated by SOX10. All of these are transcription factors, and PAX3 and SOX10 are actually synergistically stimulating MITF. MITF is important in melanocyte development and survival, so it can lead to ultimately the neural crest cells, which will go to the intermediate cells of the stria, hair and skin pigmentation, iris pigmentation, the GI neural crest pathways. And in addition, PAX3 also leads to muscle development. And so dysfunctions in these can lead to dystopia canthorum or limb anomalies along the PAX3 pathway or along the melanocyte development pathway. The GI and neural crest pathways can cause Hirschsprung disease. Uh, you can get heterochromia iridis from iris pigmentation anomalies, vitiligo, a white forelock, and synophorus, which is kind of like a unibrow. And the intermediate cells of the stria being dysfunctional can lead to hearing loss, of course, as well as an enlarged vestibular aqueduct. So if you haven't guessed this already from the white forelock, this is Wardenberg syndrome, and there are four subtypes based on which genes are affected. With any subtype of Wardenberg syndrome, there's always a risk of hearing loss, enlarged vestibular aqueduct, vitiligo, white forelock, synophorus, and heterochromia iridis. Uh, it's divided up into four subtypes based on the genes involved and the other phenotypes that you can get. So Wardenberg syndrome type 1 is a mutation in PAX3 that results in the original findings as well as dystopia canthorum because it's on the PAX3 pathway along the muscle development. Wardenberg syndrome type 2 is a mutation in SOX10, and it's really just that core um, set of symptoms that are outlined in the dotted line. Type 3 is, again, a different mutation in PAX3 that leads to both dystopia canthorum and upper limb anomalies. And then type 4 is a mutation in EDN3 and EDNRB, which is the endothelin, endothelin ligand and endothelin receptor. And these are really involved in stimulating the neural crest pathways of the GI tract. And so patients with this phenotype get the um, original symptoms as well as Hirschsprung disease. This is extremely rare. So you can remember that this one's autosomal recessive compared to the other three subtypes, which are autosomal dominant. The next syndrome involves genes in three different locations. First are tip links. Second are ankle links of the stereocilia, and third is at the synapse of the hair cell to the afferent neurons. This is Usher syndrome, and type 1, again, affects the tip link. So there are four genes that are commonly involved in this type, myosin 7a, cadherin 23, protocadherin, and harmonin. Type 2 it affects the ankle links. These are present transiently during development. They're not in the mature in, uh, in the mature hair cells. The genes involved are Usherin, Ush2A, and Wurlin, Ush2D. Type 3 affects the synapses, and the main gene here is Clarin. All genes involved in Usher syndrome are located in both hair cells and photoreceptors. So what you're really thinking about is hearing loss, vestibular dysfunction, and vision loss. Type 1 results in deafness at birth, di vestibular dysfunction at birth, and childhood vision loss. The tip links are super important, and without them, all three of these functions are really limited. Type 2 results in moderate to severe hearing loss, normal vestibular function, and adolescent vision, vision loss. And type 3, the synapses, results in late onset hearing loss, late onset vestibular function, and again, adolescent vision loss. Overall, the, the underlying pathophysiology is that there's eventual loss of the hair cells and rods and cones. These patients get a peripheral vision loss first and then ultimately end up with this tunnel vision phenotype. The last syndrome we'll talk about in this lecture doesn't really have a place to put on this diagram because it's so early in development that it gets affected. But it has a couple of genes involved, and we'll start with EYA1, which is really important in organogenesis. Um, it also has a big role in hair cell fate once it gets to the organ of cordy. It's located in the otic vesicle, the branchial arches, and the anterior segment of the eye. Another set of genes, the six genes, six, one through five, also like located in the otic vesicle, branchial arches, and renal tissue, uh, works synergistically with EYA1. 
These patients will have hearing loss because the hair cells and otic vesicle is disrupted. They can have external and middle ear anomalies in, on account of the brinchial arches one and two being affected. They can have inner ear malformations because again, the otic vesicle is affected. And usually these are hypoplasias. So hypoplasia of the cochlea and of the lateral semicircular canal, as well as enlarged vestibular and cochlear aqueducts. Also commonly found are second brinchial cleft cysts and sinuses. So a reminder that these are usually anterior to the SCM, again, because of the brinchial arch involvement. They can have kidney anomalies because the six genes are involved in renal tissue. Uh, these can be structural, functional, or both. And congenital cataracts because EYA1 is in the anterior segment of the eye. So brinchial arch, ear anomalies, and kidney anomalies. This is brinchiotorenal syndrome. So let's talk about workup. If you're referred a patient who failed a newborn hearing screen, first you'll wanna confirm the hearing loss, preferably with an ABR, that would be best. And of course, get a medical family history because you may or may not actually know the family and the family may not know of any history of genetic disorders. But you don't know if it's a genetic disorder just from a failed newborn screen, so you have to have a pretty broad differential diagnosis. And your workup will also include infectious testing, so CMV, syphilis, rubella, and viral torch infections, which can also cause hearing loss. Imaging is usually warranted either CT or MRI, and the other workup you'll get is based on some of the things we talked about. So EKG, because of course you can't miss Dravet-Lang-Nielsen syndrome because of the risk of sudden death. Uh, refer them for an ocular exam. That's to find out about Alport, Usher, or Brinchiotorenal Syndrome. A urinalysis is helpful for Alport and Brinchiotorenal Syndrome. And then genetic testing is an option. So the common genetic tests that people send out for are Connexin 26, which is GJB2, Connexin 30, GJB6, and Pendrin, which again, SLC26A4, the most common cause of uh, syndromic hearing loss. Management is really to help these kids hear in any way they can. I think the important keys are when cochlear implants are warranted and at what ages. So for bilateral severe to profound hearing loss, bilateral cochlear implants are warranted at two years of age and older. For bilateral profound hearing loss, uh, they can get cochlear implants as early as nine months. Hopefully this was a helpful review. This summary is available for download for your reference. Thanks so much.